I think I should get to the lecture. <laughs> as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. Okay. So, um, okay. So, one more example of uh, um, uh, of integration. Okay. Um, so let's look at. Uh, so you have in the plane the point zero and the point uh, one plus i. And we're going to look at the integral of the real part of C um, along two different paths uh, that start at zero and end at, uh, at the other one, one plus one. So the first one is um, we're going to go along um, just <coughs> uh, one plus t, I think. Plus t times t, as t, uh, as t goes from t goes from zero to one. Right. So when t is a when t is a wait a second. Yeah, one plus i t. Hold on. Let me yeah, get my my, 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 my Sorry, I must have just miscopied it. Oh yeah, one plus i t. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, 1 plus i, 1 plus i t, so t goes from 0 to 1. Okay. So, um, you know, what's that, what's that going to be? That's going to be the, the integral from 0 to 1 of, um, uh, you know, of course, uh, t, 1 plus i, dt. Because you're taking the real, you take the real part of real part of real part of gamma, and then gamma prime. Right? The real part of gamma, gamma prime, dt. Right? And so you integrate that, and you get um, plus one plus i um, uh, integral from zero to one t dt. And so that's one plus i. Right? Remember, this is going to be. Um, this is going to be the real part of gamma of t, gamma of t, gamma of t dt, right? And so the real part of real part of this is just is just t, right? And the gamma prime is is one plus i and the other dt. Okay. So one calculation, and then we'll do another calculation. Um, so that's going. Uh, um, uh, we'll do another one. So that, that one is going straight, straight from here to here. Right? And then the other one we're going to go, um, that we're going to go across and then up. <coughs> across and then up. Um, so the first part, and one is going to be t, um, from zero to one, and then gamma two is going to be one plus <coughs> at. Again, from Goes from zero to one, right. and you end up with the integral from zero to one of t dt um, plus the integral from zero to one of one minus i dt, and you get one half plus uh, one half plus i. So the point is that, is everyone okay with calculations? I probably should have let you do them just for practice. Um, uh, the point is that uh, you notice, you observe, and hear that you get different results. Maybe we get different values when we take, when we take different paths. Any, any questions on the, on the calculation? So, uh, one time, so, yeah. 
like because you get the real part, the real part of this, right, which is one, and you get the derivative of this, which with respect to t, which is i. That's the real, real part of gamma two t times gamma two prime t dt. Okay, um, so that leads us into the notion of path independence, which should be somewhat familiar to you from before, from calculus, but it's slightly, you know, it will be similar, a similar, similar idea. <coughs> so let's recall first the homology of calculus that we mentioned last time, right? Um, uh, if you have um, uh, a contour, and you have f and little f, big f and little f, continuous functions such that uh, big f is an antiderivative of little, of little f, then the integral over gamma of little f, as we saw last time, is just you know, the difference of of um, a big F evaluated at the endpoints. Okay, and um, uh, in consequence, um, if F has an antiderivative. You know, you know what's going to happen. Um, uh, integrals, uh, contour integrals, are independent of path. Right. Contour integrals are going to be independent of path right, because it's just going to depend on the endpoints. Right. And second, um, easy, um, uh, an integral. Over a closed path uh, is going to be zero. Yeah. So is the if f has an antiderivative, is that the start of the remark, or is that yes. a continuation of the other? Yes. So the remark is if f has an antiderivative, then you have these consequences. In fact, uh, these notions are all uh, equivalent to each other. So here's, I think, this is called path independence thing. Um, so this is something, just to be clear, this is something that would not hold over R2. This is just due to uh, con uh, complex differentiability. Yes. Yes, I think so. I'm just thinking of like the wire Strauss function, for instance. 
that's uh, continuous everywhere with differential nowhere. Yeah, but that's um, that's sort of a different. So you're thinking of R on R. R right. Yeah. It's a function on R one. Yeah. Um, See, so sort of a different. Yeah. Let me show the, the interesting part of this. Uh, the interesting part is to show that, um, um, well, is it obvious to everybody that, that 2 and 3 are, are basically the same, same statement? That if, you're, if any contour integral is path independent, then any integral with a closed contour is going to be 0, and vice versa. If you're, okay, I'm going to skip that. That's, that should be clear. Um, the interesting part is to show that, show that an antiderivative exists. Right. If you if you have this property, this uh, one of these one of these two equivalent properties, you know, then you, you're you're guaranteed an antiderivative. You can make an antiderivative. Okay. So uh, the interesting, uh, the only interesting one is that uh, number two. So here's how you do it. You say, well, um, uh, fix some point in the domain, and you define uh, f of z as the integral from z naught to z um, of f. OK. And um, you know, this, is, this is sort of bad notation, but I hope you know what I mean by this. It means to go, you're taking the integral from over any path from z naught, z naught to z. And it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter what path you take, right, because the, the integral is path independent. Okay. So when I, when I write this, it means um, the contour integral. along any path from z naught to z. And that's well defined because of the equivalence of 2, uh, because you assume path independence. Okay. So what we'll see is that that f prime z is little f. That this that this is the antiderivative. So you just um, you just fix any you just fix any z naught, right? And then for for any point z, you, you integrate uh, you integrate little f along along the path from from here to here, and that function is your antiderivative. Okay, that's sort of what you might expect. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 clearly a, a you know the your original fundamental theorem of calculus. Where you create an antiderivative by integrating your function along the, you know, uh, along partially along the, uh, the the interval is is related to this, as you see. Okay. So, um, so what do you do? Well, okay, let's look at it. Prime z. So consider f prime z is the limit of f of z plus h. Here, h is some complex number. Z goes to zero. <coughs> okay, so that is what's that, right? You go from uh, from z naught to to z plus z naught to z plus h minus. Uh, Z not the integral from z not to z, right? So you can you can choose it so that um, when you uh, when you subtract, um, you get you get this you get this integral. I mean you get this you get a path from z to z plus h, right? So this is going to be the integral um, from z to z plus h. And 
we can choose it. We can choose uh, can choose the path to do a straight line say. At least for, for small enough for small enough h. We know that h is going to zero, so um, for small enough h, it's okay to, to assume that this path is a straight line. play a trick, we say um, this is the same thing as the integral from z to z plus h. From z to z plus h of f of zeta minus f of z b zeta plus f of z. So we throw in, um, throw in this constant, right? Which is okay because when we integrate, when we integrate this constant over this, we get one. I'm sorry, we get a uh, constant times one. Right? F of z is constant with respect to zeta. What you're going to end up with is the integral of from z to z plus h of f of z one. One be zeta, right? And that's just going to be one. You get f of z times one, right? So it's okay to throw in. It's okay to throw in this. This. Uh, so this equals f of z. So I can I can subtract it off here as long as I add it back there. So I'm, again, the trick is you know you're putting in a fancy looking zero. Everyone, everyone okay with that? Any questions? Okay. So, um, wait. So you know why we did that, right? We, we're doing that because we're hoping that this uh, this limit is going to be f of c, right? So let's find out. Um, you know, let's throw in the f of c and subtract off the f of c and hope that this thing is zero. We can make this as small as we want. Right, we're trying to show that this is equal to f of z. There's no f of z in here, evidently. There's no. It doesn't look like this f of z. Let's put in f, f of z. Okay, but we can't. We we can't just do that uh, at our whim. We have to you know, put it in in a in a disguise zero. Okay. So uh, so we want to. We want to look at this thing, right, and show that it show that it is zero. So, um, okay. So choose so fix any fix any epsilon greater than zero. Um, uh, F is continuous. So. Um, is a delta greater than zero such that if h if h is smaller than delta, then uh, f of zeta minus f of z is smaller than epsilon for all zeta on the path on that on the line segment. From z to z plus h. Okay. It was z, z plus h. Okay. We have this line segment. Okay. So <coughs> there's going to be some, there's going to be some, some delta, delta neighborhood of z, so that as long as you're in that. As long as you're in that neighborhood, then all your values are close. As long as zeta is is in that neighborhood, then f of zeta minus f of z is smaller than epsilon. Okay. So choose your choose your delta so that for small enough h, choose your delta, and then for small enough h, you 
your line is going to line within that neighborhood, right? Your line will line in that neighborhood, and so everybody, everybody, uh, all zetas on that line will satisfy this equation, satisfy the same equality. Okay. So this will be small. Okay, so that's that. Basically, uh, does it for you, um, right? How do we how do we finish it up? Maybe we should let you finish it up. What's the end? Right, we're trying to show that 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 thing is small. Right, well, well then, one over h, um, the integral from z is equal to h. Theta minus f of c uh, is zeta. What can we say? What can we say about this? Right. This thing is this thing in the inside is less than epsilon, and so by uh, using using triangle triangle inequality. Using triangle inequality, you get that this is smaller than um, uh, this epsilon. You say that. H goes whatever epsilon you take as h goes to zero, this is initially going to get smaller than it, right? And so the limit is zero. Yeah, Christian. I miss how you get from that to less than or equal to epsilon. Uh, so this is just epsilon times the integral of one from z to z plus h, right? So you're, what is this? What happens when you evaluate this? This is going to be epsilon times epsilon value of h, over h, epsilon of h right? which is epsilon. Okay. Oh. Well, yes. thing. Yeah. Why was it necessary that uh, the path from z to z plus h be a straight line? Well, it didn't have to be straight, but it, I wanted it to stay to be controlled that it, does, it doesn't go too far away from. Um, you see, if I chose some sort of indirect path like this, uh, right, then when I take my neighborhood, then if I took my neighborhood like this, um, right, if my, even if my h were small, my path might leave the neighborhood, which would, which would be. Um, which I don't want. Right? I want. I want the whole. I want the whole path to stay within the delta neighborhood. That's that's fine. <coughs> this this fact that we're using here, uh, it's it's kind of useful. So let me let me single it out. Um, um, Notice that um, if, f, if the modulus of f is bounded by some m on a curve c um, with r point l, then the absolute value of f is equal to c. Is controlled by n, n times f. And just to make it uh, completely clear, uh, right, 
this uh, equals the integral from a to b of f gamma t which is smaller than the integral from a to b of this size of your function is, is smaller than m, then the absolute value of the integral is going to be smaller than uh, m times the arc length. And that's, that's, that's basically maybe more, more clearly written what's, what's going on here. Right? This thing is smaller than uh, epsilon, right? and so you're going to get epsilon times the arc length, which is uh, h over Okay. 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 Now let's get on to something good. I know. Uh, now finally, let's do some uh, something that's uh, we'll really get to the uh, the cool parts of complex analysis. Okay. So. Um, so we're, we're now we're going to head towards Cauchy, Cauchy's integral formula. Uh, before we get to Cauchy's integral formula, we'll get to a sort of intermediate stage called the cauchy coursat theorem. Um, uh, I think uh, in the book they call it Cauchy's theorem. Sometimes they call it this cauchy coursat theorem. Um, uh, I used to have um, a bath towel with Cauchy's integral formula printed on it. And uh, I, in my previous, the last time I taught complex analysis, I gave this as a prize. Uh, like I, I, I uh, bought several uh, bath towels with Cauchy's integral formula printed on them in Japan um, at this mathematical institute, and I gave gave one as a prize um, to the top scorer in the class. But I, I can't find them, so too bad, too bad for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a small bath towel that you use, and uh, you know, it's not it's like a, it's not a gigantic one. It's one of these like hand towels or something. Okay, okay. so. Um, Cauchy's theorem. So, um, so here is the way I think Cauchy stated it. Um, let C be a simple closed contour, and R be the uh, closed region interior to C. So you have some simple closed closed curve. And then R is the R is the, the stuff that's on the inside and including including the boundary. Okay. So C is C is C is the is the boundary. C is the boundary of R. R is is this closed region containing the boundary. Um, if f is analytic on R and f prime is continuous on R, then the integral of f over c is zero. That the proof that Cauchy gave uh, relies relied on, on Brent and Green's theorem, although they note in the book that it was published five years before Green's theorem was, was published. So um, you know, Cauchy should probably be Green's theorem should probably also be called Cauchy's theorem. Um, uh, um, just understanding Green's theorem and using the cauchy riemann equations, um, and that, that that gives you that gives you this result. Um, now, uh, the proof that Cauchy gave uh, uh, had this assumption that f prime be continuous on R. Um, 
Okay, that actually turns out to be unnecessary. We've mentioned you know, several times that f being analytic will mean that it's infinitely differentiable. And so you don't need to assume this. This will be a consequence. Right? F prime being continuous, you don't need to assume it. Right? So it's actually um, a bad move into actually, uh, it's, it's a bad move to make, to, to make this assumption at this point. Now, uh, so it's uh, apparently the, the insight of, of Goursat, I'm not sure, Goursat maybe, um, that you can, you, can, you can prove Cauchy's theorem without making this assumption. So I'm going to um, write up uh, Goursat's version. And that's the one. Okay. Sometimes this is called Cauchy. So if uh, F is analytic, Basically, but you just don't, you don't you don't need to assume continuity of the derivative, which is good because we're going to use this to show that that uh, analytic implies infinitely differentiable ultimately. Okay. So we don't want to assume that it's, it's, you know, it's we don't want to make that assumption. <coughs> okay. Okay. So isn't this just the path independence that we were talking about? Yeah, so uh, it's saying that if you have an analytic function, um, then you're guaranteed path independence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So an analytic function um, will have an antiderivative. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. okay, so here's the proof. Uh, the proof is kind of kind of cool. Um, <coughs> okay, so. We're going to do it in the case of uh, rectangles, no triangles. Excuse me. So suppose C is a triangle. Call that triangle delta delta naught. See so this triangle delta naught, and you're going over, you're going over the boundary. Um, now uh, create a sequence of triangles. value of the integral, the integral of f of delta i plus 1 exceeds 1 fourth of the integral of delta i of f over delta i. Okay, and the, the, the idea is this. So you bisect, you bisect each side of the triangle. Okay. And you make four triangles, you make four subtriangles. So delta delta zero is the big guy, and then you're going to choose your delta 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 one to be um, the, the any one of the sub triangles whose uh, for for which the the, the the absolute value of the integral exceeds a quarter of the absolute value of the integral over the original delta zero. Okay. You know that there's there's got to be one one of them that exceeds a quarter. Right, because um, the integral over delta zero is the integral over let's call these uh, let's call this one t one, t two, t three, t four. Okay, so you've got these four four sub triangles, right? Just the just the boundaries of the triangles, right? Um, uh, you know that this is. This um, the integral over over the integral over this thing is going to be the integral the sum of the integrals over each of these each of these guys each of these paths. Okay, so it's going to be the integral of t1 plus t2 plus t3 plus t4, okay, which is less than or equal to the uh, the triangle quality so less than or equal to this. Right. And 
so you know that one of them has to exceed a quarter of this, because if they all did not exceed a quarter, then this would be less than itself, right? This would be less than itself, which is which is impossible, right? If they all if 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 they all um, you know were if all of the integrals over the sub uh, over the the smaller paths were less than a quarter, then we get something strange. We get a contradiction. Okay. So. What a, at least one of the triangles has to um, has to satisfy this. Satisfy this. Right? Okay. So choose that one. Um, you know, choose that one. You know, let's say that it's let's say it's t three, and we're going to call call that one delta one. Okay. And, you, and we we ignore all the other things. And then we do the same thing. Divide this one into sub sub triangles. Choose the choose the rectangle in delta. Choose the rectangle in here. I'm sorry, the, the triangle in here that carries more than one quarter, and call that one delta two, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you get a sequence of sequence of triangles, um, so that uh, you know the integral over you know the i plus one guy exceeds one quarter of the uh, absolute value of the integral over the i guy. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, if we consider uh, the solid triangles, okay, consider the solid closed triangles. Each of them is compact. Right? They're all closed and bounded, so they're compact. So um, uh, we're just going to use the fact uh, um, they exist by compactness. They exist a single point that lie that lies in all of the triangles that lies in the intersection. Take all this, take all the solid triangles, and, and you intersect them all. Right? They're all compact. Um, the diameter is decreasing. The diameter is decreasing to zero. Those of you who have seen compactness before know that that you're guaranteed to have to have an intersection. Um, and by the diameter decreasing to zero, it's going to be a single single point. So um, I'm not going to I'm not going to prove this, but it's true. So um, we're going we're gonna to try and show that the integral, right, our goal, of course, is to show that the integral um, over the original guy is 0. Going around the, the original triangle, we get 0. So um, let me go back. So you know, will play the usual game of showing that it's less than any epsilon. So fix, choose any epsilon. Um, F is analytic. So um, uh, the limit as z goes to z naught of f of z minus f of z naught over z minus z naught minus z prime z naught is zero. Okay. It's analytic. Um, in particular, it's analytic at, at z naught. Okay. Let's call this thing. Um,
we know um, there exists a delta so that if the distance of z from z naught is smaller than delta, then that thing is smaller than epsilon. That's what it means for the for the limit to be zero. The limit is zero. Well, we can make this thing smaller than smaller than epsilon. Given control of how close we are to, to z naught, we can make this thing smaller than epsilon. So um, notice how we constructed the f, how we constructed the eta f of z um, equals f of z naught plus f prime z naught z minus z naught um, plus eta z z minus z <coughs> by construction. this, and you just multiply both sides by z minus z naught, and then move everything over to one side. So just, just by, by this equality plus arithmetic. z minus z naught, and then move everything, keep z naught, f of z on one side, and move everything over to the other side. And that's, that's, that's this. Okay. So, um, uh, so, um, so over any triangle, um, if we look at the integral of f over that, over that triangle, um, we can write that as the integral of f of z naught plus f prime z naught z minus z naught plus eta z z minus z I'm just just substituting. Of, of this over the <coughs> over the closed triangle over the boundary of this triangle. This is a constant. Right. What's the integral? Just that times the perimeter of the, the triangle. No. Uh, so um, think like this. Uh, you can find an antiderivative of this. This is a constant, right? You can find an antiderivative, namely z. You integrate. So what's going to be the? You're integrating something with an antiderivative over a closed closed loop, right? So the integral is zero. zero right? Similarly for this one, right? This is a constant. You're integrating z minus z naught, which is an which ha also has an antiderivative, right? So the integral of this thing over the closed loop also is going to be zero. Okay. So what you're left is that you're left with this thing. The only the only thing that matters is, is this thing. Or I should have said Christian that, but the answer is yes, you're right, and the answer after that becomes zero. You get the integral over the over the triangle, which is zero. So, um, so the point is that these have, uh, have antiderivatives. 
So what we get is uh, so this equals this, which equals this. <coughs> okay. And so remember our picture. They zoom down to some, some point Z0, right? to some Z0 you know, in the intersection of all these triangles. Right? And what we're saying is that um, we know that there's some neighborhood of Z0, right? there's some, perhaps, some delta neighborhood of Z0, so that all points, if, if Z is inside there, then this eta is smaller than epsilon. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is um, choose and large enough <coughs> that um, if C lies on the on the nth uh, triangle, then Z not C not is smaller than epsilon, smaller than delta. Right. So just choose your um, zoom in far enough that your whole triangle lies inside that delta neighborhood. We, we chose, we said there's a delta neighborhood of Z0 so that the eta of Zs are going to be small. We're going to zoom in far enough that our whole triangle sits inside that neighborhood. Okay. Right. In that case, <coughs> then if we look at the integral over that small enough, small enough triangle, right, we get um, eta Z. Z minus Z naught, Z, um, which by the triangle inequality uh, smaller than this, and now we know that this thing is smaller than epsilon, right? And so. Um, what we're going to end up with is that this is smaller than epsilon times uh, Sn over 2 times Sn, where Sn, you're going to use Sn to, the, to denote uh, the perimeter of, of uh, delta. So the, the length of the Perimeter. <coughs> I'm like, you know, does perimeter mean the length of the boundary, or does it just mean the boundary? Oh. Length. So, so I don't need to say the length of the perimeter. Okay. 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 Um, right. Um, because. Uh, uh, the distance from z to z naught is going to be controlled. If you just think about triangles, the distance of the boundary to from a point on the boundary to a point inside the triangle is controlled by the half the perimeter of the of the triangle. So this thing is smaller than half the perimeter, and and um, so we're going to get <coughs> epsilon epsilon times half the perimeter times the times the arc length, or well, the arc length is the perimeter. So um, just to get you back, it'll take just a second. Um, uh, so we chose, we ch uh, remember we have this, this neighborhood around, we had this neighborhood around, neighborhood around Zena where um, Ada was small. We're gonna choose, uh, we're gonna zoom in far enough with, so that our triangle sits inside that neighborhood. Okay. So if we integrate our function over <coughs> the triangle, 
Well, then eta is going to be smaller than epsilon. Okay, so this thing is smaller than, this thing is smaller than epsilon. Um, we're using S of n to, den to, to denote the, um, the perimeter of the, of the triangle. And so um, the distance from a point on the, on, the, on the boundary to the point inside the triangle is controlled by half the perimeter. Um, and so this, the integrand is going to be controlled by this. And this is the arc, this is the arc length. Okay, so that's, that's what we, we get. That this, the integral over, <coughs> over this magic nth triangle Right, which lies inside our, our neighborhood, is, is this small. Okay, okay. now, um, uh, now remember, um, uh, so notice first that the perimeter of the nth triangle is 1 over 2 to the n times the uh, perimeter of the original triangle. Each time you have the you have the have the perimeter, right. um, and recall how we chose the delta, how we chose the triangles. Right. The integral over uh, over one stage was greater than a quarter of the integral over the original of, over the previous stage. Right? So what does that give us? That the integral over the nth stage is going to be bigger than um, 1 over 4 to the n times the integral over the original stage. Right? And that's what's going to give us the control. Right? We're trying to show that this thing is small. Trying to show that this thing is small, <coughs> so we have control of this thing by the integral over the nth over the nth uh, over the nth guy. Okay. So I'm going to move the four to the n over here. Okay. And uh, what you get is that this is less than or equal to four to the n epsilon over two. Right. Epsilon over two times S N squared. Which is uh, epsilon over two times the perimeter squared of the original guy. Epsilon was arbitrary, right? Epsilon was arbitrary. So we see that you know, this thing is because it's smaller than epsilon over two times times this constant for any epsilon bigger than zero. Okay, so you can make it as small as you want. So that's the proof of, of Koshi Kusan. You see that, um, at least for, for triangles, <coughs> we have for triangles. Um, if you have a polygon, if you have, if you have a polygonal region, then you can divide it into triangles. Right. So, you have three, you have a bunch of triangles where you integrate over each one and you get zero, and that will give you an integral over the, over the whole polygon. So if you, have a, if you have a polygonal path, then you can use this result to, to get it over any, any polygonal path. And then, um, and then, I, uh, and then I, I think, I, I'm pretty sure you can get from there to any contour just by approximating uh, 
just by approximating the contour with a polygonal path. Right? Any <coughs> contour you can approximate with a polygonal path, and then you know, show that in the limit, you get zero. But that's actually not how the book does it. So I'm gonna next time I'll, uh, I'll we'll go a slightly different route from what I'm from what I'm saying here, just to stick with the book. Maybe depends on, on how things go between now and then. Okay. Any any questions? Any questions? I feel like this. This is sort of cool. Um, and this is the the key 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 proof. Any questions? Right, we're trying to show that the integral over the triangle is zero. We see that the integral over the triangle, if we choose we choose our sequence of triangles you know, cleverly, so that the integral over um, the nth triangle controls the integral of the original original triangle. We use the continuity. We use the, we use the uh, sorry. We use the analyticity of the function to show to to see that um, uh, and the fact that these things have antiderivatives to see that the integral over the nth triangle is small. Right. The integral over the nth triangle. Right. The integral of f over the nth triangle. Well, these these parts vanish. You end up with this. Right? And the analyticity. Gives that, gives that we can make this as small as we like. Making this as small as we like means that we can make this, the, ori the integral over the integral, the, the original triangle as small as we like. And so it must be zero. Okay, that's it for today. I'm not gonna, not gonna make you guys learn more. <laughs> that's it for today. <laughs>